turn there, Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 9. I don't know how two ugly guys can get married to two pretty girls like that. That is amazing. <laughs> they had to pay a lot of money for that one, is all I can say. <laughs> Hebrews chapter, that was, two, that was two couples right there. And, um, I, you know, I just, that's, sometimes, you know, you look at miracles, you just saw one, ugly and pretty. <laughs> we can call them the thorn, the thorn bush. Um, I'm quartet. The girls are the are the rose, and you're the thorn. But anyway, Hebrews chapter one. Once you've found it, let's all stand as we read the word of God. Hebrews chapter one, verse nine. If you have it, give a good strong amen. amen. That's the kind of weak one. If you have it, give a good strong amen. amen. There you go. Scripture says in verse nine, "Thou hast what's the next word? Loved what? What's that next word after that?" righteousness and what's the next word hated iniquity therefore God even thy God hath anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows some very interesting words in, in this verse right here and I want you to notice that very first two lines where he says thou hast loved righteousness and hated iniquity I want to talk to you this morning. If you'll listen to me this morning, I can help you, one, overcome some sins in your life. Second, I can help your relationships. And I want to speak to you this morning on the subject, the love-hate relationship. The love-hate relationship. And I think if you'll listen, you'll understand what I'm talking about in that little phrase right there. Father, take these next few minutes and allow me to be a help to thy people. Lord, there are people here this morning that this is truly the answer for them finally getting victory over some of the problems in their life. This is also the answer for some to keep their relationship strong. Now, Lord, I'm asking you, would you allow us this morning to be open to thy Holy Spirit? May we learn what we need to learn. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Years ago, when I traveled, I, I took a trip to England. While I was taking my trip to England, I stopped by, there's a place where they keep the crown jewels. And when I say the crown jewels, that's the, the, all the crowns that the queens had, had worn and the scepters that the kings had and some of the diamonds and just the precious jewels were all in this place. When you walk inside of this place, you know something very valuable is on the inside because there, some reason there's men standing outside with machine guns and they're not smiling at you as you're walking inside. And it just kind of helps you to keep your hands in your pocket and not try to do anything really bad. You know what I'm talking about right there. I had never seen anything. We, we growing up in a Western culture, we don't understand king, queen, because that's not in our mindset. I didn't understand what the, what, uh, what, the, what the meaning of the throne was, what the meaning of the scepter was, what the beauty of a crown is. I never quite understood why God would put in his scriptures, says that if we do something that he'll give us a crown. He talks about the crowns that he's going to give us at the judgment seat if you're saved. I never quite understood why God would say he's going to give us the crowns until I went to that place. And I went inside and I saw these crowns. And the crown was pure gold and had jewels all around the top. And you're seeing these jewels and it's like, these are not like any other jewel you've seen. It's not the cubic zirconia that you put on your wife's finger. If somebody say amen right there. You'll understand what I'm talking about on that one. But, it, it, I mean, we're talking, we're talking real stuff. That, I, mean, it, I mean, and the diamond. I think the biggest diamond I saw was about that big. It was a huge diamond. Just phenomenal. Then I came and I saw this tall, looked like a pole, just this tall, about this tall. And I asked the person who was giving me a tour, I said, what is this? He says, well, that's what they call a scepter. And I thought, I never thought a scepter was that big. I've always thought a scepter was just like a little stick like this, you know, just a little stick that they hand out, somebody touches, and okay, you're welcome into my palace. But no, this scepter was big. It, it's, it, was, it was at least the height of my head right here. And as you look at that scepter, on the, it, was, it was gold on the outside. And as you looked at it, there's a little 
crest on that scepter that they had literally um, put inside of that whole scepter. It was the crest of that king. Every king has his own crest. And that scepter was big, so all of a sudden it began to remind me about the book of Esther. If you remember the book of Esther, Esther had not been into the king's palace. And she said, if I go in, she says, the king has to hold out that scepter. Now I understand it because it's something this big and it's a deliberate thing that he holds out that as he holds it out, you touch it and it gives you peace with the king as he holds it out. It allows you to be in his palace. It allows you to be in his presence. The scepter that the king holds. I think about that and I realize that God, talking about here, in, is he says in verse 8, he says, But unto the Son, he saith, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. Notice this next phrase, a scepter of what? Righteousness is a scepter of thy kingdom. It, get this now. So what God's saying is, he says, my scepter, he says, if you want to put it this way, he says, this is my scepter of authority. My righteousness is what gives me authority. You say, why does it give you authority? Because nobody is as righteous as Jesus Christ. Can we just get past this idea that all of us, that none of us in here are any good? Somebody say amen right there. I think we think we're a whole lot better than what we really are, but when you really come down to it, all of us are a bunch of filthy sinners saved by the grace of God, and it's only God's grace that he would look down from heaven and say, you know what, I'll save that soul right there. I'm glad that God's righteousness is what gives him that authority that we can look up and say, yep, he's God. I was talking to someone this week and said, are you a sinner? They said, no. I said, wow. I said, you've never lied. No, never. I said, you just did. I looked at that person. I said, I either have to believe you or I have to believe God because God says for all have sinned. I said, so either God's a liar or you're a liar. Somebody help me out. And I said, if I have to choose between believing God and believing you, the God that created this world, I think I'll believe God. You see, everybody is a sinner, and God says that his scepter is a scepter of righteousness. But here's the strange part. Here comes the sermon. He says in the next verse, he says, Thou hast loved righteousness and hated iniquity. You know what's strange about this verse is to have both love and hate in the same person. He says, thou hast loved, talk to me now, thou hast loved what? Righteous. Say it with me, thou hast loved what? Righteousness, but thou hast hated what? Iniquity. He says, he says, in this same person, follow me carefully, is love and hate at the same time. You see, he says, he says to be, in other words, that's what God's saying. He's saying to be filled with love and hate at the same time. It seems impossible, but get this, truly it's impossible to only have one without the other. See, when you love righteousness, I want you to follow me very carefully, you can't help but hate iniquity. The love-hate relationship is a must, get this now, if you're going to live a righteous life. Illustration. If you love doing right, you're going to hate whatever keeps you from doing right. Huh? If you love God, get this now, you will hate the devil. Sit up, son. This isn't bedtime right here in the front row. Sit up. This isn't bedtime. So I, I either love God or I love the devil. But if I love the devil, I hate God. If I love God, I hate the devil. You can't have one or the other because they're, they're enemies with each other. You see, we live in a world that says, oh, I love, 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 love. No, but if you truly love, you're going to have some hatred inside. Listen to me very carefully. We have to understand that if I truly love, then I'm going to truly hate. Illustration, if I love flowers, I hate weeds. Huh? How many, of you, how many of you ladies, you love flowers in here? How many of you ladies love flowers? Yeah. You know what that, that means? Every hand that's raised has hatred inside their heart. You say, what do you hate? I, you hate weeds. You know why? The weeds will kill your flowers. 
That means you hate okra. Somebody say amen on that one right there. I knew that was coming out somewhere. <laughs> Listen, I've been having too many people this week throwing this okra's junk at me. I want to preach against that sin whether you like it or not. <laughs> okra straight out of the pits of hell. But anyway, can I tell you right now, if you, if, if you love the beauty of the rose, you're gonna, it don't matter how pretty that weed is, that weed's going to choke out the beauty of the rose. And you're going to look at that weed and you're going to say, I want to kill this weed because I love my flower garden. I want my flowers to grow. If you love green grass, you got to hate the weeds. They're going to kill that lawn. You can't love grass and love weeds at the same time. You either love weeds. Now, sometimes weeds look better at the beginning, but at the end, they have the thorns. You see, you, you always have love and hate. For instance, if you love truth, you're going to hate what? Lying. You know, when people say, when people tell me, well, that's just a little white lie, then you don't love truth. Because when you love truth, you're going to hate any type of lie. doesn't matter how it's packaged. You're going to hate the lie. Because that lie is the enemy of what? Truth. So if I want to tell the truth, that by the way, mom and dad, that's why you cannot be passive about, you say, I want my children to be truthful. Then you can't be passive about your children lying. You got to say, that's not allowed in, in this house. Let me tell you something. Lying ought to be just as bad as a curse word. Because if you love truth, listen, that's what I hate about our society right now. You can't trust the news media because you don't know if they're telling the truth or not. And, we, and we're living in a world where, where lies are constantly being thrown out. Doesn't matter who it's by, just being thrown out at some point. I find that the only place I can find truth is inside of God's word. That's where I can find some truth. It never changes. It always comes to pass. What God says is always going to happen inside of life. Hey, thank God. Oh, there is a place we can find some truth inside of life. Ready? If you love being sober, you'll hate alcohol. This is just the introduction, so relax a while. If you can't, can't even go a step further, if you love your family, you'll hate alcohol. Because alcohol doesn't do anybody a bit of good. Listen to me. If you love family, you hate what hurts your family. If you love freedom, you hate what enslaves. If you, if you love justice, you hate injustice. If you love America, you hate what hates America. If you love success, then you hate laziness. Do you understand? Whatever I love, there's the opposite of, of uh, people say, oh, you're too black and white, Brother Domley. No, let me tell you something. Everybody's black and white or they're off balance. You either, you, if you have love, true love always has hatred inside. Listen to me. I hate communism. I hate socialism. Why? Because I love America and I love the freedom that our nation has and I hate that which is going to destroy what's going to destroy our nation. We got back here Brother Curtis. Brother Curtis, can you wave your hand right there? Just help him out. So, Brother Curtis, 98 years of age, World War II veteran. Yesterday was D-Day. This man understands what it's like to storm some beaches. He understands what it's like for to give your life and watch your, watch your, 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 your friends and your mates around you to be killed. Can I tell you right now, oh, America needs an old-fashioned love for America and the, and the flag and say, hey, thank God for this nation. Let's hate what's going to destroy this nation. You cannot have love without hatred. Scriptural hatred, get this now, we'll have godly love. Let me give you four things that the love-hate relationship affects in your life, and then we'll pack our bags and go have a treasure hunt. But we're not almost done, so hang on for a while. Number one, the love-hate relationship affects your decisions. It affects your decisions. When you truly love someone, listen to me, you will hate anything that will hurt what, what, how much you love them. Can I tell you this? 
You know what keeps a spouse faithful to his spouse is he loves her. She loves him. I want you to listen to me. The thing that, okay, if you truly love your spouse, you're going to hate, you're going to hate the pornography world that's going to destroy your marriage. Can I just tell you, the pornography world, can I tell you, all they're doing is making objects of ladies, and ladies are not an object. Somebody say amen. amen. They're a human being that ought to be treated as a human being, not as an object. But the pornography world has made them an object that men look at and they have wicked thoughts. If you love your wife, you'll hate pornography. Somebody help me out right now. Don't get quiet right now. You see, because if I love, okay, if I love my wife, I want to hate somebody trying to make a pass at me. Well, amen, preacher, good preaching. Listen, somewhere we've got to have a revival in this love-hate relationship. You say, why? Do, do you love your marriage? Listen, if you love marriage, you'll hate divorce. And if you hate divorce, you've got to say divorce is never an option in my marriage. What's going to work out? We just have to make it work out. I, I tell couples often when they come into my office and they're struggling, and I say to them, I said, now listen, I said, now, now, you, now divorce can never be an option. It's like a lifesaver. That you're not going to swim if you have, a li if you have one of those um, little, li those little um, lifesaver um, um, vest on that's going to help you to float. You're going to just stay right there and not swim. But when you throw the lifesaver out and it's you and your wife in the ocean of marriage and you say there's no way out, we're going to make this thing work, you'll make it work. But we've made it too easy. They got, I, I get tired of driving around our town seeing these little signs. An uncontested divorce is only a few hundred dollars. Hogwash on that. Somewhere there ought to be somebody that says, I love my marriage enough. I hate what divorce does to my children. I hate what divorce will do to my life. I'm not getting against some of you who've already gone through that. I'm talking to some of you right now. Hey, if you could, you could solve your marriage problems if you would say, I hate that. It affects your decisions. Dad, if you love your children, you'd be the dad you're supposed to be. Some of you dads with anger problems could get over your anger if you truly love your kids. Because the anger is not teaching your children anything good. I hate knocking on doors around here when I'm talking to ladies and they, they're, they're afraid. And they're afraid of their husband and their children are afraid of daddy because the threatening words... He always says, listen, listen to me, just because you're not beating them physically, tearing them down with your words is just as wrong. At some point, we ought to look at our children and say, I love my children enough that I would hate the sin that would cause me to mistreat them. See, it always affects you. Okay. It affects your decisions. If you love being out of debt, if you love financial freedom, you'll hate the debt that, put, that, that puts bondage on you. Somebody say amen. You'll get that credit card under control when you love having the freedom of finances where you're not sweating every month. Somebody say amen. You get, you get, you, 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 you go out and you buy and you buy and you buy and you say, oh, I'll figure it out tomorrow. You better figure it out today before you go buy. Because the bill will come tomorrow. I said one, the love-hate relationship affects your decisions. Number two, the love-hate relationship keeps you in balance. Keeps you in balance. You ever hear churches, oh, we're all about love. They don't hate anything. They're not all about love. Follow me very carefully. Brother, Brother Joseph, come here a second. If this microphone line, if crossing this line is on the other side of sin, 
If this is sin where I'm standing, then if I love this young man, I want to keep him as far away from this line as I can. And the one who loves him is not the one who lets him just, don't you put your foot over the line. What's wrong with you? The one who loves him is not the one who lets him get so get as close as you can to that line. Don't cross it. Get as close as you can. As close as you can. Don't touch it. You got a, you got a, a little bit more. You can you can scoot over just a little bit more. Uh, uh, no. Stop it. <laughs> this isn't the guy that loves you. The guy that loves you says, you know what? The preacher, he comes over here and says, son, I want to keep you as far away from that line right there because I've, I've counseled people. I'm old enough to see people who've crossed that line. I've seen the other side of that line. I've seen the heartache. And son, I, let me tell you something. I love you enough. I want to try to keep you away because I don't want you to fall one time and end up on the other side. It doesn't make you better than those who've ended up on the other side. I'm just telling you, I love you enough that there's times I'm going to tell you to keep your hands off the girls. And there's going to be times I'm going to tell you, hey, you need to be a show winner and you need to cut your hair. You need to look like a young man. Why? Because I'm trying to help him turn out for right so he doesn't cross this line right here. Thank you. You can go back to sleep. You see, it keeps you in balance. A loving church will hate sin. A loving parent will hate the friends that will destroy their child. When you have true love, you will also have a true hatred that balances it all out. Number three, a love-hate relationship affects your ability to overcome sin. Now, let me ask. I'm talking to some of you right now. You've been struggling in sin. Listen to me. How much do you hate it? How much do you hate it? At some point, you got to hate it so much that you abhor it. You don't even want to be around it. Someone texted this. Oh, yeah, I know it was. It was Samantha. I'm sorry. I wasn't supposed to bring up the name. She texted me okra, a picture of okra, and they're polluting their daughter by letting her eat okra. I can't believe that. She says, when's the last time you've had some okra? The last time I sinned. Listen to me. I hate okra so much. I, I, I just don't get around. I don't get around it. And, and some of you people, I take you out to eat every once in a while, and then you buy okra on my bill. I'm going to start making you pay the bill. <laughs> I'm not going to get in an okra field. If I do, it's going to be with the plow. You with me, Tyreek, on that one right there? We're going to plow that thing up. Because I hate okra. I hate snakes. Just the, just the, Brother Trimble. That song leader over there, somebody needs to pray that he gets right with God. You would think that he would support his pastor, wouldn't you think? He texted me this picture about a week ago about all these snakes. And, and he, he, you know, of course, he, he, doesn't t- he doesn't do the words first. He's just like the devil. He puts the picture first. <laughs> Sends me this picture of snakes, and I see it. I'm over here trying to, I mean, you just, just look at it. I hate snakes. I was in Georgia, preaching in Georgia in the backyard with this pastor and, and, and this pastor, hey, Brother Donnelly, come here. He says, he says this, um, um, this moccasin just, just struck my boot. He says, come help me find it. You're on your own. <laughs> my foot. <laughs> no, we're getting in the car. We're out of town. <laughs> what? Because I, st- I, I hate snakes. You hate sin, you'll stay away where sin happens. You'll stay away from the friends that feed your sin. You'll stay away from the atmosphere that feeds that sin. You, because you hate that sin, you say, I'm tired of this thing controlling me. Listen to me. Then at some point, you've got to hate it so bad that you say, I'm going to stay away from everything. That would cost me to do that. 
Number four. The love-hate relationship reveals your fellowship with God. You show me how much you walk with God, and I will show you how much love and hate you truly have inside you and how balanced it is. You said, but hate is bad. No. There's times in the scripture that God hates. Does that make God a sinner? No. But love and hate with God's viewpoint balances it out. You don't, listen to me, God never hates the individual. He hates the thing that the individual does. That's where we have the problem. Because we have a hard time separating the individual from the sin that is breaking them. And this world is so filled with hatred because they can't separate people from what's breaking people. We can get past the mentality that let's go after people. No, let's go after the sin. Let's go after the sin. We live in a broken society because we've allowed sin to focus on the individual. I don't hate the alcoholic. I hate the alcohol that's destroying the alcoholic. I don't hate the drug addict. I hate the drugs that's tearing the drug addict down. I don't hate those who are, who are, who are doing, who are, who are in establishments of adultery in the city. I hate the sin that's causing them to do that. I don't hate the liar. I hate the lie that's destroying the truth. I don't hate the sin or the, the sinner. I hate the sin that the, that's breaking the sinner. Oh, ladies and gentlemen, at some point, do you understand when you get God's love and God's hatred? All of a sudden, you can separate the person from the sin. And you can say, that's just a broken person right there that needs God to fix them on the inside. Can I go one step further? If you love heaven, you will hate whatever will send a person to hell. I'm not against the baptistry. You all know that. We baptize here every week. Once you get saved, the next thing commanded to do is get baptized. Nothing wrong with that. But if you're trusting that baptistry to get you to heaven, that baptistry will send you straight to hell. Because getting wet doesn't, listen, if getting wet gets you, gets you into heaven, then every time you take a shower, you're, wash, you're washing away your sin. This is simply an act of obedience after you get saved. If you're trusting your good works, it's going to send you straight to hell. Do you understand, ladies and gentlemen, the fact is this. If I love heaven, I'm going to hate whatever sent a person to hell. This good works mentality, look at me, this good works mentality that we have in this world that, well, I, I can't tell you how many people this week I talked to. Well, I think I'm going to make it to heaven because I, I think I've done enough good. And I, I pull out my calculator. My wife says, you like that calculator illustration, don't you? I said, yeah, because it really shows us what we're like. And I said, how old are you? are you? They'll tell me and I'll multiply the years by 365. And I show them, if you've just done one sin a day, that's how good you are. Most time it ends up over about 10,000. I said, if you stood before a judge with 10,000 crimes, you're not that good of a person. We think if a person commits five crimes, oh, terrible. Hey, we committed, if you're, hey, there's some of you, you're old enough committed over 10,000 sins. You think you're good enough? I hate hell because when people go to hell, they will burden there forever and ever and ever. But I love the gospel. 
I love the gospel that Jesus Christ died on the cross. He said the wages of sin is death. There's only one way for sin to be paid for, young man. That is that somebody's got to die. Somebody's got to die. If I died to pay for my sin, I'd burn in hell. But thank God the scripture says, but God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. The communion table didn't pay for your sins. The preacher didn't pay for your sins. The baptistry didn't pay for your sins. Jesus Christ paid for your sins. His death, his burial, his resurrection has made the whole payment. Here's the key. You have to apply that payment to your account or you'll go straight to hell. I don't think you ought to say that. I'm just telling you the truth. I love you enough to tell you the truth. You're in a place this morning. If there's ever a place you could get saved, it's at Maranatha Baptist Church. We love to help people to get saved because we want to see everybody in heaven. You're here this morning, and you're not sure you're saved. If you died right now, you're not 100% sure your next breath be in heaven. God loves you. He hates the things that are going to send you to hell. But it's true enough, but God says the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. God says, let me give you the gift. All you've got to do is receive it. You say, how do I receive it? For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord might be saved shall be saved the very second I ask Christ to be my savior boom you're saved forever paid for I love you enough to tell you how you can get to heaven I hate the false gospels that will send you to hell I hate the sin that will destroy your life because I love you as your pastor. There may be times I may sound a little hard and a little harsh just because I love you enough to tell you the truth because I hate what's going to hurt you, Father. I'm so grateful this morning. You hated hell enough that you sent your own son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross to pay for our sins. He was buried and he rose again. He made the payment for our sins so we could go to heaven. Oh, God in heaven, there be someone here today that does not know you as their Savior. I pray they get it settled today. There's some this morning that they've been struggling in the love with, with the sin. They need to get a hatred for sin. I pray they come down to this altar and say, God, give me a hatred for the sin that's destroying my life. Give me a hatred for the sin that's destroying my marriage. And give me a hatred for those things that are hurting my relationship with you. God, help us, I pray. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed and no one's looking.